That's to the topper, right? That's to the topper, yeah. Sword of Glory. I joined a regiment called First Horse. First Horse? Yeah. <laughs> Makes it's sense. a joke. Yeah. <laughs> He's commanding a bloody army. Yeah. And tomorrow there's a war. He'll get the entire army bloody butchered. Mm. My father never settled there. He had a dream to settle back at his home after a time. Yes, homeland. Homeland? Yes. And look at me. I'm a lieutenant general from Indian Army. Right. Having spent 40 years in uniform. Yes. And today I'm a migrant in my own country. It's, it's sad that the people of India are not understand. Right. Wow. <laughs> Three, two, one. Yep. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, I am honored to have you on the show. And shout out to your son and my buddy Govind who made this happen. And uh, sir, uh, I first first thing that I really want to discuss is how's life after your glorious career in the Indian Army right now? Like, are you chilling? Are you having fun? Like, how's life? <laughs> and how was life when you joined the Indian Army? Like the NDA? Day? I'm sure you. No, I, I was from the short service. From, from the short service training. Is, is it right to assume that most of the people who reach the rank of general, be it major general, lieutenant general, so are they have to be from NDA or no? SSC also leads to. Well, in a way, it is right. Um, as far as there are three communities in the army. Right. One is a short service commission officer right. from uh, first twelve days of officers training academy in Madras, Madras, yeah. Madras or Chennai. Chennai. The second is the NDA. Right. Who joined after twelfth class and they graduate right. from National Defence Academy and then go to Indian Military Academy. Right. And For find the information. Yeah. And the third is a direct entry where you go after graduation to Indian Military Academy General. Right. CDS. So you pass out from right. there. So those are permanent commission, whether the short service commission has to get a permanent mm. after a tenure of five years. Right. Is your question of being raised to the rank of left general? Yes, there is a very stiff competition in the army. Right. It is not a um, ill unhealthy relation or a unhealthy competition. It's a very healthy term. competition. Right. It's professional competition. Right. You have to compete. A lot of exams, a lot of things, and you rise. Mm. Um, coincidentally, right. I am the first short service commission lieutenant general who became and commanded a strike corps of Indian Army. No way. Awesome. And strike corps means that corps which has got no task in the in Indian territory. Its task lies across the international border. The day the war is broken. Loving it already. Nice. That is yep. my one of my lovely claims and achievement that I can post about right. that I'm a short service. Short sure, service you should. Board. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, in, so you haven't experienced the college NDA kind of stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. When I did my schooling and yeah. then I did my graduation. Right. I was in fact a science student, uh -huh. physics, chemistry, biology. Yeah. But somehow I joined the army and I do OTA and. Um, I got commissioned in 21 years of age right. and I retired at 60 right. and I done full 40 years in 21 years of training. See. So 40 years of commissioned service, right. I rose to the highest rank in the Indian Army as sure. Lieutenant General. Right. I am number of first in my life. Hmm. I am the first Sikh officer from Kashmir Valley to have become a Lieutenant General. Right. My father was the first Sikh officer to be commissioned into Army as an officer after 1947, after partition. Right. I was, I joined the regiment. I passed out as first in the order of merit from the officer's training academy. We were number one in passing. Yeah, Did the you get the sword of glory? Yes. Yeah, it's called merit. Sword. sword, right? Yeah. That's to the topper, right? The to the topper, yeah. Sword of glory. I joined a regiment called First Horse. First Horse? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the first short service officer to have become a lieutenant general, a command, command a strike corps. Respect, sir. Max respect. <laughs> and now you said after I have retired, right. the word that I use with my friend is now I feel liberated. <laughs> so I'm in a freedom and right. enjoying and chilling. Right. But then yes, the army is in my blood. Sure. Can't yeah, 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 you can't. Down. So I'll do anything for the army or for the services and for the nation. Right. And what's the reason? Is it, uh, you know, people nowadays kind of run away from this word patriotism, but is it like sheer patriotism, love for your land? So what's the reason why you still, after superannuating, like after retiring <coughs> from the army, you still want to go there? Is it the, of course, you won't get the battlefield kick anymore, obviously. But what's the reason? Like, do you like the charm of it? Or is it a mixture? Or is it just pure sheer patriotism that okay still want to work for my country because I think my country you still needs me. Like I told you 
<coughs> it's like a viral injection. Yeah. You know, antivirus given right. to you right. right in the beginning when you're born. Right. Polio drop type of things, you know. So here it is embedded in us. Yeah. In our blood, it's all services. When I've been born, I was born and I'm a second generation army officer. Right. So it's in my blood. I've seen the tradition, the customs of the Indian Army. Mm. It's the most beautiful organization. Yes. A political, yes. non corrupt. Correct. Okay. So we lead a very healthy and a pure life. Right. And we lead from front. We are taught to be leaders. Right. We are responsible for the lives of the men that we command. Millions of them. So they follow you blindly. Yes. You can a wrong action can get your men killed. Sure. So we have a tall responsibility and the response that we get from a man right. is into the battlefield without any question. Right. There's not to reason why, there's not to yes. question why, you know, into the mouth of hell. Right. Lord Tennyson had mentioned that. Yes. You don't find in civil organizations or even in a corporate world. Right. People switch job, they don't have loyalty. Right. We have a deep rooted loyalty to the organization. It's in our blood, it's in our psyche. We cannot get over it. And even after retirement. Yes. There are so many perks, the organization caters for you and looks after you. ECHS, you know, ex-servicemen contributory health scheme. Right. Till your death, you're a member of the ECHS community. Yeah. You're given the best of treatment outside. Right. Whereas a man from a civil street will not, not be guaranteed yes. or given that. Yeah. Even the government doesn't provide. Yes. So although we are paid for it, we are members of that, but the kind of respect, honor as an ex-serviceman you are given and you are called for various functions, you, it's always maintained and you maintain your decorum even out after you are you have retired or superannuated. You, that, you are that, a gentleman you, right? and an that's officer you, yes. and so you can't forget it. Yes. You just can't, I can't go to civil streets and behave like a, you know, yeah, you can't, you can't. I can't do that. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> so, and the best part, legally, we have been granted by the government of India to carry a rank. Like a title, I am Lieutenant Gen. If I introduce myself in city streets, right. I say I am General Mehta. Right. I won't say I am P.S. Mehta. Right. Yes. I can, it is legally authorized to me to carry my rank. So if I carry my rank, I have to behave like one. Yes, and rightfully so. Yes. So those Absolutely. are the differences, essentially. Right. Uh, so, so, how was your SSB experience? Like, when I am sure you were very young, spent by 21. So those four days you have to spend, because I have cleared SSB. I cleared SSB, but there is a merit list also, NDA ka. So mm-hmm. I cleared the medical and everything, but I couldn't make them merit list and after that, like, career switch. I'll like, tell you one thing, very interesting. Yes. That army was, not, was no choice of my career. Right. It was no choice. Right. I never wanted to join the army. Yeah. My first choice was Merchant Navy. <laughs> my second choice, after I my went, switch from <laughs> army was Merchant Navy. <laughs> I wanted to go to Merchant Navy for the basic reason that I wanted to explore the world. Travel the world, yes. And travel. Right. And second was uh, medical. Yes. Since I was a medical student, right, and I don't know why I took medical uh, after I passed my school, I just went in maybe because of good marks and those days, tenth. Um, yeah. So I went into medical stream. I cleared the exam for T S Rajendra. Okay. I cleared the pre medical test of Jammu University, and I got a seat also in the Jammu Medical College. Right, GMC. And while I was representing Jammu University in basketball for the nationals, I was uh-huh. training in Jammu. Right. And my friend came and said, tomorrow is a CDS exam. And I said, you go ahead and give it. Yeah. So he said, no, no, you also supposed to give it. Here's your interest set. So <laughs> when I saw the handwriting, I recognized my dad and my photograph and he had posed my signature ah. and filled the form. So anyway, we read that night, we read General Current Affairs and General Knowledge. Right. And English. And next day we went and appeared two days and we I went through these two exams. Right. The last was mathematics. Right. I didn't know maths yeah. because I was a science student, so I never went for the exam. Okay. Had I gone and appeared for math and passed that, I would have been in IMA, right. Indian Military Academy. Because of the score. But I did two exams, right. so I was qualified for short service commission. Right. And before the call for those two, much Navy or medical college joining right. would come, the call of SSB Allahabad came for joining Army. Right. So my dad coaxed me, he said, you go, it will be an experience for T.S. Rajendra. Right. So I went and did that SSB, I got to go through. Fathers play an important role. I the medical and lo and behold, I was called to join Officers training but school. Sir, you, you, should have, you should have appeared for mathematics as well. Because this time a negative marking. Nahi hoti thi. You should have done BB. Not BB, only BB. negative marking, I appeared in Grey Hall in Jammu. Old yeah. Jammu. Yeah. There was so much of cheating. And yeah, I know, I know how it goes. I have appeared. And my papers were being taken of general knowledge. <laughs> I could have cheated and got through math. And you know what effect did that have on my destiny? What? 
when I went to short service and had I done that match, I would have gone to IMA. Right. I would have not lost nine months of my seniority. Nine a months. short service chap, when he goes to and becomes a permanent commission, right. he loses nine months of seniority to get equated to the next course of IMA. Right. Because right. their difference in training is nine, nine months. One and a half month, the one and a half year, and ours about eleven months. Yeah. So had I done that, I would have hundred percent become an army commander. Hmm. Because of my age, right. when I commissioned right. from OTA, I was barely 21 years old. Right. Yeah, that was very young. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That's, that's an awesome story. <laughs> Sir, let's just dive into business now. Okay. I, yeah. So, uh, so my opinion, uh, I really have huge, huge respect for Pakistan because Pakistan has been a good enemy since '47. So, well, he has been. We well should, said. Well said. I'll, I'll talk on that. Yeah, yeah. So, he, Pakistan has been a good enemy, and uh, most of us accept it, but it's not a popular feeling because people don't. I don't know why they are in denial or for what reason, but they don't. Jammu make a colloquial essay, but locally, if you know what that means. So, it's not a partisan, like Nak me dum karke rakha for the people. It's, it's obvious, right? Everyone knows it. And I'm a huge fan of how Indian Army has been giving a befitting reply since 47 and succeeding in that every single time. So, uh, do you think there's this disconnect between, uh, you know, us common folk and the military right now? Do you feel like that, that there's this huge gap that people don't understand what the military is doing actually and they look at them in a darker side like, you know, they're not pro army for some reason. You see, there are a couple of basic issues we must understand in Indian Pakistan context. Right. <clears throat> Firstly, why was Pakistan created? Hmm. Okay. It was created because of a very solid reason. I will explain that. Yeah. And why was East Pakistan created from Bengal? Right. The reason is that from 1857 and beyond. When first time that Mangal Pandey and that issue of the first war of independence, yeah, it yeah. started. Uh, that started off. After that, the Indians got together and started becoming anti-British. Right. And there was a treaty of eighteen hundred and nine between the East India Company and Maharaja Ranjit Singh, okay, who was the Punjab Punjab okay. king, yeah, the, uh, Maharaja. Right. Now that time, Punjab was a massive state. Yes. The northern borders of Punjab was with Afghanistan. Right. There was no Pakistan. No. The northwestern or eastern borders were with Nepal. Nepal, yeah. And the southern portion of the boundary of Punjab was the Satluj River. Right. right. Neighboring with Delhi. Right. The boundary of yes. Delhi and Punjab. Now, the treaty said that when, when Maharaja Ranjit Singh realized that the East India Company is now expanding its domain from Calcutta. Hmm. Toward the east coast, Vijaywada, and they started coming down toward Madras and right. captured Madras and right. made the Madras presidency. Right. And the second prong was going from east to west through Bengal, right. that is Calcutta, Chakadarpur, coming toward the central India, Jabalpur, right. and Sagar. Yeah. That was the second prong. The British were gradually capturing the territory. And this was the company, and not the throne. It was the an throne expansion. Yet. It was no. company. Yeah, it was. It was company. Yeah. And, and it was all being, uh, you know, ordered and designed right. from England yeah. under the crown. Right. And then after Madras, the British started going north. They had that massive battle with Tipu Sultan. Mm. We somehow Indians don't give him that kind of regard. Right. Unfortunately, yeah. he was a man who fought with Britishers like a tiger. Right. After they defeated Tipu Sultan, they came up, they bypassed Goa, the Portuguese, uh, you know, Europeanized part of the Indian context, and they bypassed and went up, and now came the Narvada River. Right. The, the most or the largest continent, or not the continent correction, the piece of uh, domain which was under one single Maharaja was a Rashtra called Maharashtra. Maharashtra. The biggest Rashtra in India. Right. It spread, spread from Narbada in the south hmm. to Yamuna in the north. Right. That is beyond Agra. Right. And east to west from Katak to Attak. Katak to Attak. Because yeah. of its size, it was right. known as Maharashtra. Right. There was no Madhya Pradesh, there was no Uttar Pradesh, they were all part of Maharashtra. Right. And it was being looked after by then Mahadji Sindhya number one. Right. I'm talking of se late 17th, beginning of 18th century. Hmm. Where the for getting his troops 
Europe and I, the Mahatiji Sindhya joined the British and welcomed the British forces and did not fight. Hmm. So the British had a clean run from Narmada to Yamuna and they came right on top. Right. Now when this happened, they started, the British wanted to cross the Satluj river of right. correction. Before that, they sorted out Delhi, right. the Mughal domain. Right. After having won Delhi, now they said, now their expansionist dreams were, you know, going haywire. Right. They said, let's cross into Punjab and then let's go into Afghanistan. And they were also looking at getting hold of the Middle East oil fields. And they so faced a very weak Mughal empire at that time. It was Bahadur Shah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that was sorted out with the British. Right, right. They captured Delhi and went beyond. So when Ranjit Singh saw all that, the two famous wars were fought, Anglo-Sikh War Anglo -Sikh and Anglo -Sikh Sikh Sikh. Yes. first and second. Anyway, now coming back to your question. When all this was happening and after 1857, when early 1900, when two states got after the British and there, that was the Greater Bengal, mm -hmm. Bengal state of India and Punjab. Punjab. They butchered Britishers, their children, their women folk and all that happened and because of this the Britishers failed and they realized now it is time to get out of India it was nearing 1940s right. before the independence hmm. so they said the best thing to do is to avenge these two states so the Britishers carved a plan of two nation theory right. which was brought and it lapped up by Muhammad Ali Jinnah right. and by Jawaharlal Nehru right. they both went for this damn thing right. and Muslim and as luck would have, large amount of Muslim demography was in Bengal mm -hmm. and in Punjab, right. neighboring Afghan border and central Punjab and things like that. Right. So they created a divide and divided the two big states of India to teach these two states a lesson that you bloody messed with us, we're going to cut you apart. So they cut West Greater Bengal into East Bengal and West Bengal. East Bengal being, became East Pakistan and Punjab was divided into two. Three Ab went to yes. Pakistan and two Ab remained in Indian Punjab. Right. So let me interrupt you. Yeah. So, so you are saying this is like uh, groundbreaking for me right now because of that Bengal and Punjab, yeah. what they did to British, just these two massive Call it kingdoms or states. Yeah. Did, 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 not kingdoms, but yeah, took these two messages. It was a big state, yeah. The, yeah, big states did to British. Mm -hmm. It was a repercussion that they, out of vengeance, did that. Precisely. Did. So you're saying that it is because of those. Oh, yes, of course. And now coming to your question. Right. Now these two states were divided and they were partitioned took place and Punjab was divided into two. Right. West Punjab and East Punjab. East Punjab yeah. Now East Punjab was Indian Punjab yeah. and West Punjab was Pakistan. Right. Do you know, do you, while this was taking place, the Britishers were very smart people, they had a lot of foresight, they came up with a formation of Indian, of British Army mm. called a DEP, -E Delhi and East Punjab Headquarters. Delhi and East Punjab Headquarters. East Punjab Headquarters, which okay. was raised on a locomotive, on a train, okay. on, on the railway station of Lahore. Okay. And Lieutenant General Russells right. was the first commander. And this DEP command came to be re christian later on after 1947 at Western Command, which is in Chandi Mandir, Chandi Way today. Right. Western Command of the Army, Indian Army. Right. It was DEP Command. Right. Now, DEP Command, mandate given to them by the Britishers was safe transfer of population. Punjabis and Hindu Sikhs from West, pa West right. Pakistan right. into East, East Punjab, right. West Punjab to East Punjab, right. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And similarly, in the Eastern part of the Bengal. Why and that train? was looked after by separate Why are trained? Like the, they were, they were so to... smart that right. they wanted the transfer of population to take place. Right. The refugees go there, Muslims go there, Hindus and Sikhs come here and let's finish up the whole thing and ready divide it permanently. Right. And they achieved it. This was the beginning of Pakistan. This yes. was the birth of Pakistan. Right. Because of the British mean and clever move right. the Indians didn't understand. And Jinnah bought this two nation theory and uh, circulated it as that Muslims should have a different. Uh, he wanted a single state called a Muslim, pure Muslim state called Pakistan. Right. But he did allow certain minorities to settle down right. there, like in Hindu, Sikh, Christian, and Parsi, yeah. and we will look after you and all that. Right. But that we will talk about later how their demography has changed. Sure, sure, sure. And here is the connect of Jammu and Kashmir hmm. during this time when Maharaja Hari Singh. Who was a Hindu Dogra leader of the boss of the of the Jammu and Kashmir state, mm, right? With the largest population of Muslims under him, right? In in the valley and in the areas of Gilgit, Baltistan, and the Pir Panjab belt, yeah, yeah, Pir Panjab belt. Okay, north of Pir Panjab. Right. 
अनफॉर्चुनेटली दिंदू महासभा ऑफ जम्मू राइट डिड नॉट गिव द करेक्ट एडवाइस टू महाराजा हरी सिंह he they told him that you should not join either pakistan or india yeah. and we will remain a secular and an independent kashmir and we will maintain our identity that's when tribes attack right that's when the tribe now the pakistani smart right. pakistani said now the time and it was the it was jinnah's dream that we have to take kashmir somehow by hook or by crook hmm. while he was showing a very good front on this and partition and will be secular pakistan this backstab preparation was going on. right Hello. and yeah that took place in 1947 when the kabayli or the raiders yes. came all the way from uh, you know quetta and peshawar those areas right down till pakistan they came into uh, they crossed the international border right incident right the international border was drawn by red cliff hmm. with representatives of india and pakistan sitting with him on a table and charting this border on a point to point on the on geographical border right. on maps right and this was ratified by both the party the current pok came under india's domain. yeah i'm coming right. to that right. you see the international border was drawn right and it in that international border jammu and kashmir complete jammu and kashmir state with its five divisions right of jammu kashmir ladakh gilgit and baltistan right. were part of jnk hmm. inside india right it was granted by red cliff to india right now the pakistani thought that no this is not achievable hmm. there was one major brown who was in gilgit who sided with muslims right. because he was the commanding muslim troops brigadier uh, <coughs> rajinder singh if i am not rajinder singh ji was fought fought, fought in, yeah, yeah that's right so all this happened so pakistan actually came by deceit intrusion hmm. infiltration backstab and came in three prong one right. went to punch the other went to kashmir right. third went to ladakh right so they captured this area kept on fighting and came surprised india ha huh. till maharaja realized ke i am now losing pakistani troops are outside sirina right. they reached sharifabad right. which just barely 17 km and they right. were reaching the outskirts of sirinagar airport yeah airport. so he knew that this thing is going to i am going to lose my state yes so he signed the instrument of accession with india with yeah. india that i am joining india had he done that earlier hmm. it would have been a different story or had indian since that time unfortunately indian polity that time did not have a foresight like mm. pakistan right. and jinnah did yes nehru did not unfortunately i am naming it he yeah. did not have foresight yeah. there were no milit- political military foresight yes had they said told the chef uh, maharaja hari singh who is now running on a cavalcade of cars from srinagar to jammu mm. he had i am told about 16 or 20 car cavalcade with all its treasures and everything right. they left srinagar driving down mm. the instrument of exercise should have not been signed and indian army should have been sent in and thrown out the bloody pakistani there would have been no instrument of exercise signed mm-hmm. there would have been no article 370 there would have been no 35 right. and kashmir would have been part of jammu and kashmir would have been part of india like junagadh and gujarat side right and hyderabad so you're saying that indian army should have <coughs> punched their way yes. in and just taken it finally did punch yeah we but did. again there was stupidity because of accession we were stopped we were stopped at odi and that was the foresight of sheikh mohammed abdullah right sheikh mohammed was again a very smart and very smart guy like his sons now yeah he's very smart they yeah. very they have foresight yeah they are very clever mm. he did not allow the indian army somehow he convinced nehru not to go beyond udi he said we will not be able to control muzaffarabad and the basic reason was beyond udi no one speaks kashmiri were non kashmiri yes. muslims yes there were pahadi gujjar and all right. and there was one person those days a leader of that area called choudhury hamid a gujjar maybe choudhury yes. yeah. choudhury hamid right he was a leading lead man over there and this chap was threatened politically that in case we go beyond and that chap gets more vote he become the chief minister of jammu and kashmir yes because, because the population this, is more right over there yeah, yeah. that was the basic reason why sheikh mohammed abdullah convinced pandit jawaharlal nehru and stopped indian army shot up udi right right so that was it and the these are the reason now right. coming to your original question of why they hate pakistan yeah no there was so much of butchering right lakhs of people died hmm. they were mercilessly cut upon rape loot the mayhem of baramulla if you know by kabali 12 days right. there was loot lust and plunder in the town of baramulla right I have my relatives from there, my nani is from Bara, mm. and we have heard stories from her and other old people who were eyewitnesses that time, including right. my dad, right. who was a second-year college student of Amar Singh College in Sirinagar. 
Baramula, just short of Baramula, two kilometers, my mother's village, Singapore. So they are eyewitnesses, they have told us everything. Girls were raped. Mm. After raping, they were picked up live and thrown into Jhelum River. Right. They were killed. Large number of fathers, Sikh and Hindu fathers, killed their daughters, axed them, so that they don't fall into the hand of these Mughal, you know, the Kawaii right. were coming right. and they are subject to this kind of brutalities. Right. So all that happened for 12 days. Mm. They did not even spare the hospital, St. Joseph's convent now, earlier the hospital by the, right. by the Christian. Right. The nuns and mother superior were raped by these people, killed. Right. So it was a very sad story which yes. went in. And that is the basis of hatred of Indians, civilians with the Pakistanis. Right. As far as my army, yes. uh, appreciation of a Pakistan soldier or Pakistan army, you very rightly put across, I am happy to learn from you. That you are saying Pakistan is a good end. See, <laughs> can't yes. Let me qualify that. And large number of people don't even understand this and talk about it even in the Army Navy Air Force. Right. You know, Klaus Witts, a famous general, right. I, I had said, right. never underestimate your enemy. Hmm. If you under, underestimate your enemy, you are bound to fail. Right. Because he might be stronger than you at that point of time. He may have better troops, he may have better equipment, right. better strategies and tactics and you lose that battle. Right. So we have been somehow underestimating Pakistan. Hmm. I for one have never underestimated Pakistan. I say Pakistan army is a thoroughly professional army. Hmm. They always take the lead and the initiative. Right. They have preempted all wars, right. all actions against India. General uh, Ziaul Haq, yeah, yeah. again look at his foresight and right. thought. You know his foresight and thought does not end at Octopac, yeah. which was to avenge India, the Bangladesh revenge. Right by thousand cuts and bleed India. Yeah. India is a massive Goliath, right. where Pakistan was small in size, so it could not outrightly kill India. Mm. So it believed in the theory of thousand cuts, bleed India soft, right. you know, slowly. And that's how the insurgency in Kashmir started. Yes, It's happened now for 30 years. Right. It's carrying on. An Indian army does not have a strategy to sort it. After 30 years, you go and say your surgical strike number one you've done. That is nothing. That is nonsense. Right. One surgical strike or putting Balakot uh, strike by the Air Forces should have been done 20 years back right. or 25 years ago right. to cut it in the nip it in the bud. Right. That now you are doing it so late. That means you never understood your enemy, you never appreciated your enemy. Right. There was no policy, there was right. no political will, right. there was no military will. Right. This was lacking in the country and still is lacking. Right. But I won't uh, hesitate to say but with the BJP government now coming, right. there is emergence of political will. I, I, I see that. Many people see Anybody that. Yes. can see that, right? right? And they have, whether they are right or wrong, at least they have the political will to go ahead and do it. Decisiveness. They yes. have done. Yes. They have demonstrated that and I am sure it will happen. And I for one, when I was a general, I knew that in case there is a war with Pakistan, it will happen only in the times of BJP government and not Congress government. Right. I want nothing to do with these parties. I am an apolitical man. Sure. I never voted in my life for any party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm very, I am telling you the ground here. Right. Pakistan is a very professional army. Right. They have changed their tactics, their ground, their divisions, their boundaries of various divisions and core across Indian army on the borders and in line of control. Invariably leading number one, then India could do. And mm -hmm. India would follow suit, right. come up with defensive measures or amend their tactics and strategies because the new strategies or tactics evolved yes. by the Pakistan. Right. So that way, Pakistan is a very clever army, it's not an easy army. Right. But how to take it on? There are plans and thoughts right. which have been carved out. We can take on Pakistan and there are many ways. Right. All that is required is a very strong political will and a very strong military will right. to achieve it. Sure, sure, nice. Uh, and another thing, so whenever something happens with Pakistan or China, so uh, I'm talking purely in terms of conflict. So when the news comes out, it often gets divided. The opinion gets divided into ideologues, right? It either goes to left or right. It goes to left or right. So what I want you to explain to us and the listeners is the apolitical view of the Indian army. Whenever anything happens, I don't know why people end up calling army people warmongers for some reason, right? They do. Army? Yeah. Okay. Because, see, because they are like war hungry, they just want to fight, fight, fight. I'm sure everyone is scared of this conflict, right? People aren't that much into conflict. They're scared. They, do, they don't want to lose their land, family, business, whatever the consequences of war are. 
but should india go to war with pakistan it's as simple because we are fighting a proxy war since 30 years i don't know 30 how many 30000 40000 people killed 42000 people as yeah. 42 martyred martyred yes so we can't have that for another 20 years but do you see like a decisive conflict between india and pakistan and if you do like what should it be like you see firstly the feeling of a common indian citizen hmm i think he's common indian citizen is naive he's got hardly any you know knowledge up his skull mm, yes i'm sorry to say that right. large people don't think on military domain what is the geography of a country what yes. is the border of a country what is the sovereignty of a country yes why do we have army navy air force right. this is a nehruvian thought which you just told me mm. unfortunately this is in in the blood of indian right. that we don't need the indian army we need only police to do sort of the law and order we are we are non aligned and we'll remain non aligned and we don't want to fight a war they have forgotten why we have indian army in the first place you know jad pandit jawaharlal nehru first blunder was there was a the commander in chief of the indian forces of the british lord mount batten among the last one yes the moment he left and we became independent the first thing he did was he dissolved this rank uh, the commander in chief was dissolved right because this was thinking of nehru that we are non aligned nation right and we don't need an army cut down the army everybody is still dead after cut down the army cut down the army. right i like to tell the seniors by through your medium yes please the citizens of india that right. wake up right wake up large number of patriotic guys say that for our today and you sleeping here and these guys are mount guarding the lc or the international right. border if the enemy declare pakistan is now doing proxy war because right. it knows it cannot do a conventional war right. but should we reduce the indian army in size met, material weapons and so on so forth air force is crime is so many 10 or 11 squadrons minus than it is authorized mm. it's a huge number which is lacking and pakistan on the other hand is growing its army right. army is weapon technologies you know aircraft and ships and what have you with the help of china and right. us in the past it will overtake us and the day it overtakes us it will not be limit to a to a con- you know counter insurgency conflict right. it will come for a convention country right. and then now i like to ask the border areas of jammu and kashmir right. punjab rajasthan and all these people now you bear the brunt of pakistan army which right. will come into their territories and bloody loot them and kill them right so then the indians will wake up yeah. our army the sovereignty of the nation is strong because of its defense forces yes. it's a big mistake by indian polity that we are not giving money to the services to buy their equipment to grow stronger and stronger hmm. it is a deterrent nuclear power right. a nuclear weapon is a deterrent it is a non war kind of a weapon it is to avoid war it right. is to tell the enemy that you do something on us we will bloody blast you with nuclear yes. site yes. so that is a deterrent but conventional standing army that means army navy air force which is very strong it is a big deterrent that you can't do conventional right Pakistan is so smart it is understood that india not only political will is weak right it is the military will also the weak and these guys have no bloody strategies they cannot go to war you saying indian army is war mongers for 30 years we have, we have got our 42000 security forces killed in jammu and kashmir we are war mongering hmm. had i been a commander i would have walked into pakistan hmm. not not listen to delhi right we are not war mongers we are there sitting for orders right the moment you give orders to indian forces to war, war against pakistan they will rise and go unfortunately they are not fully prepared hmm. because they have not been given money right look at china 6 to 7 percent of its gdp yes. which is five times or at least three times more than the gdp of india right and that's the kind of money china is allocating yes why is china becoming strong firstly because of its standing military right military means all three sides second because of the economy right and third because of strong determined political will and discipline right you look at uh, the parliament of china right when the premier walks in yes the complete parliament is in black suit white shirts mm. he goes and bows to the parliament and then they sit down it's like military discipline mm. look at our parliament breaking mics throwing at each other abusing going mm. to the well every day yes. a bloody rowdyism yes unfortunately we are a we are a country we are not grown beyond some iq level hmm. we need to develop iq in the civil citizen right military and polity last point i want to make is there are three main agencies ruling the country right one is the politicians hmm. 
second is the bureaucrats mm. or, or if i reorder it correctly first are the bureaucrats yes second are the politicians third are the services yeah. i mean abf yes now the bureaucrats have adopted the brown culture the british culture mm. they think they are the elitist of the elite in babu <laughs> after <laughs> after the british left they yeah. adopted the color of brown sai right so they became brown sai and right. they are the rulers mm. that is why all these years india has not grown constitutionally yes. politically defense wise because of the control that they don't want to lose right unfortunately most of the politicians are criminals right i know i'm making these kind of tall words but that's a reality of life everyone knows that. everybody knows the whole of the country yeah. so why shy about it yeah <laughs> they're criminal large number of good politicians right. and nationalists are not having this military strategic knowledge right of how to go about defending the sovereignty of the country yes what is required to be done Right. whether nuclear whether conventional whatever ah. and the third is the army navy air force who are sitting ready right being a political being a very very dedicated nationalist but waiting for instructions to go right. but unless they are prepared how will they go to war right so the biggest agency that is actually sorting india out is the bureaucracy mm. and the biggest enemy i don't hesitate to say the biggest enemies of defense forces are the bureaucrats of ministry of defense Hmm. You look today. I got a note. I received a news today that the CDS General Bipin Rawat has been made the CDS yes. of the in, of the India of India for the first CDS in the country. Right. Do you know how many they have granted? Thirty seven under secretaries and joint secretaries as under the CDS, totaling to I not thirty seven. I think forty two is the number okay. of the secretaries now authorized under the CDS. Right. So that means CDS is one man in uniform with forty two. Or the bureaucrats. Okay. So how will the CDS function? It's a victory for bureaucracy. Forty-two mm-hmm. additional vacancies granted against one CDS. Okay. And maybe two, three people under him as staff officers. But what if he actually needs uh, itna like you know people to work under him? You see, the separate from the army. politicians have failed to understand what the bureaucrats are doing. They're uh-huh. fooling the po- uh, the politicians. Oh. They're not giving full. knowledge to the to the politician right. they keep them at bay and they hide this information and very gradually they are they are taking away all the perks right your orop your nfu non functional upgrade right. not granted to army do you know where the army stand today army is below the central armed police forces okay. ips ifs irs right. railway services revenue services bureaucracy yes. are all about army yes in pay and in the presidents of yes. uh, you know Order of precedence. The central forces, yes, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. They they pre- succeeded. They gone mm-hmm. ahead, and you know the defence services are not A class. They are bloody B class, made B class. Whereas a foreign and a revenue or a railway service chap is an A class officer, mm-hmm. and the commissioned officer. Here is the point I want to make. Right. People should understand that bureaucrats are the servants, civil servants. This is an official term. Civil servant servants of the. people of india yes they are knockers right servants right whereas the officers of army navy air force are presidents commission hmm. the commissioned officers how yes. the hell can they be b class and these servants become a class yes that is the irony hmm that is the irony which needs to be connect corrected right <laughs> something that i never thought about i have always considered uh you know the way bureaucrats have played the game and it has gone very corrupt and how money is being distributed amongst you know so you know that's why we didn't see a lot of development in the past 70 years be it infrastructure be it a lot this thing was you know an i know opener and sir uh you uh tell me about your uh nsa experience i want to know that you've been working with national okay. security agency you see look uh, that i connected in a different manner that i was i am from Kashmir, right? Rather, Sri Nagar or Kashmir division, right? I am a son of the soil of Kashmir. Yes. Right. Before 1947, our right. family has been there, right from Maharaja Ranjit Singh time, right. when it was part of Punjab. Yes. So we continue to be there. So I am so many generations down in in valley as a Sikh. Now, in my heart and my soul. I always wanted to go there. Is such a beautiful place. Is heaven on earth. Yes, yes. it's breathtaking. So I, unfortunately, my father, who was also the first commissioned officer from Bali, Sikh, yeah, could not settle down. He went there. He made a foundation. He wanted to build a house, construct a house for staying there after retirement. But then 
all that was done before he could construct the house and we could allow him to move to Bali. Right. The complacency thing broke yes. out between India and Pakistan. Yes. And 1989-90 this started off. Mm-hmm. So for him to stay as an ex-army officer in, in the heart of uh, Baramula, right. Singapore area and all that area was right. not feasible. Right. It was sec- security wise, we yes. did not allow him to go there. Right. So that foundation still lies as a foundation over there. Uh-huh. We have not built a house there. So uh, has anyone encroached it or it's still there? Yes, some encroachment was there, but somehow luckily I was posted there as current GS in <laughs> Kilo Force. Right. And when I sorted out the papers, I realized right. the encroachment and finally it took us five years to set it right. Yes. And it is still with us. So my father never settled there. He had a dream to settle back at his home after retirement. Yes, homeland. Homeland? Yes. And look at me, I'm a Lieutenant General from Indian Army, right. having spent 40 years in uniform. Yes. And today yeah. I'm a migrant in my own country. I can't go back. My children have not seen uh, Kashmir, yes. the way they should have seen. Yes. They've not gone to the interiors. Yes. We have lost all that. And why should I be? I have commanded a strike corps that I told you. Yes. And I'm a bloody migrant. I've got, I cannot go there. Nobody will provide me security. Mm. Even if I write to governor or the DGP, a letter that provides me bloody police protection of seven people and I want to stay in Singapore. Mm. That is my uh, homeland. I'm, I'm sure they will not allow that. Yeah. So if that, even if they allow me, there's no charm of living under bloody security in a fortress. Yes. So one has lost all that. Mm. But because of that, I had always a dream. In fact, when I was doing National Defence College right. in Delhi, I took up on the dissertation on Jammu and Kashmir, that is resolution of Kashmir conflict, hmm. the issue. Hmm. It was my dissertation. I worked on it religiously from my heart and soul for almost one year and I submitted this dissertation. Right. It was basically to return back. My dream after retirement, what you said, what are you doing now? Right. Chilling out. Yes, yes I'm chilling. Yes. My dream is that I move back to Valley, settle down there, bring about normalcy, the way it would, as you know, my contribution. Mm. As I joined the forum of uh, Panun Kashmir, the Kashmiri Pandits who are outside migrants, right. to take them back also. This is one of my dreams now after retirement that before I kick the bucket, mm. that at least the Pandits and Sikhs should go back and settle down in the valley, in the orchards. And, enjoy the yes. homeland. So my dream is that and I've been working for that. Mm. Now with that backdrop when I started doing my dissertation uh, and I was in Delhi in my last posting as deputy chief right. in the IDS headquarters, right. I was recognized by word and mouth by the National Security Council of India mm. and I was invited by the deputy NSA right. uh, to the NSA headquarters right. and NSCN. And there I had an interaction with the deputy NSA and his GS level officers. And they wanted me to give them inputs. Mm. So I gave them two written inputs. And in the second written input, that was during the time when the stone pelting was going on in a big way in, in the valley. Right. That, we are talking four or five years ago. Right. Right. 2016 17. This was an incident. incident. Yeah. Right. So that is the time I gave them a 16 point recommendation mm. what to do and how to deal with those people. Right. And I'd be happy to tell you that 11 points of the 16 have been executed on ground. Right. But unfortunately, there's no pat on my back. Do you, because do you my want that? Taken. Do you want that? Like, no, I don't are you want looking for there credit? some recognition. Yes. There's yes. some recognition. Sure, yes, absolutely. And post-retirement, I'm still at it. I'm right. doing whatever I have to do for the thing. Right. But uh, it, you know, it gives you a very, it gives a dirty bile in your throat that uh, they're using you. Hmm. If they're using me, I'm willing to get used, but use me publicly. Na? Right. Use, use my bloody efforts, my intelligence, my everything, sure. my heart and soul and I, I will tell them how to do it. Right. Unfortunately, they don't know how to do it. Right. I, because the interaction that I had with NSC's right. team right. Uh, on JNK division in the NSC headquarters, unfortunately, they asked me such elementary and stupid questions. I was actually shaken out of my seat. Is this the level at country? Right. At a national security level, they, this is JNK division asking. Right. They don't know the answer, questions to answers to the such elementary question. That means they don't have iota mm-hmm. or an idea of how to deal with this problem with Jammu and Kashmir. Yes. Even till today, I'm telling. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to give all my heart and soul into this issue. They want to utilize my services. Please call me. Mm-hmm. I'm more than willing to do it. I'll go out frankly to help them because that is my dream. I want right. to Pandit and Kashmiri Sikhs to go back and right. settle down there and have. Peace right. and enjoy the same heaven which was about 40 50 years back. Yes. So, sir, there's a the thing that you know, I also believe that the current government, 
which I feel is very efficient right now with a few things when it comes to dealing with Kashmir and all. But they also want to maintain that nothing so scary is happening. You know, such things that uh, we are preparing a strategy, which apparently we are, which we are. Because uh, you see, uh, what's his name? Asif Ghafoor uh, from Pakistan. So these guys are very proactive on social media, right? They are they are playing the game. And I think we have just started. I think we are still lagging when it comes to, you know, because at the end it's a war, right? We are fighting them. And they are they have taken a lead when it comes to, you know, social media, propaganda and all that. And we are still lagging. So it does scare the common folk and the government doesn't want that as well. You have taken a military stand, right? So this is so 16 points, do this. But do you think when people, common folk, get to know that, they'll be like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> you, 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 shit might go wrong, okay. stuff like that. I'll put across two more points. Yes. I'll put across a military mind, a military yes. thinking. Yes. He can't think politically. Yet. Right. That's the general what is. Right. But what about politicians thinking politically? Hmm. Or what, if I may further subdivide it, what about socio-politics of Jammu and Kashmir? Right. Socio-politics of Bengal. Hmm. Socio-politics that is now emanating in the country. Right. When I am sitting in Pune, right. last night I saw a demonstration by Muslim community right. uh, on the way towards uh, Kondova. Right. There was open uh, kind of demonstration and protest with children and females. Ladies were part, they were saying things against the NHCAA and NRC. Right. And they were telling the children, Jab hum ye bolte hai, tum ye bolo. Huh. They were irking them to give that answer. Right. The poor children didn't know what the hell they were doing. Yeah. What I am trying to get at is, go back to General Ziaul Haq. Hmm. He had devised this Octopack. Right. It did not end at Oct- Octopack militarily. Yes. After militarily means at conventional level. Below that one step into counter insurgency yes. and below that changing the demography of mm. POK which is achieved, right. gradually changing the demography in the northern India, right. north India including Punjab, right. Okay, right. entire Jammu and Kashmir and portions of Punjab and portions of Rajasthan. Right. I have been in Rajasthan for 28 years of my military service right. and I can tell you post 2000 of Parakram right. till 2017, there is a sea change on the border belt of Rajasthan. Okay. Large number of Muslims have come and settled next to the border right. in the villages from where they have come, God only knows. Okay. They wear dhoti, tehmats, uh-huh. and they wear skull caps, which are never seen in Rajasthan. Right. They were soda Rajputs, which are converted to Muslims. Right. And they still maintain Rajput culture. They used to wear turban. Yes. That is gone. That is what is happening to Rajasthan. That is what is happening to Punjab. Hmm. You look at Rohingyas now in Jammu, why? right behind Sanjuwan camp. Why? Why? Yeah, exactly. Who brought them there? From Assam to. Yeah. Imagine from Burma. <laughs> right. They have crossed the entire Bangladesh, length of 3,000 kilometers. Yes. And come to Jammu and Kashmir. Right. Why didn't they go to Hyderabad? Yeah, exactly. Why, why didn't they go to the other places? Refugees, right? yeah, Central India, UP, yeah. MP. Why didn't they go there? Right. Why? And how did they come there? Yeah. And they have got proper. I am sure you must have seen that camp. They got electric connection, they got yes. Aadhaar card, they got everything. Yes. So this, and now, the second point is, the Jammu and Kashmir people, especially the Jammu division is crying for last 10-15 years that they are being encircled by a Muslim belt. Mm. If I may spell it out, right. starting from Vijaypur, mm. the heights of Vijaypur towards right. Udhampur, that northern heights, from there, Vijaypur, come to towards Jammu, right. Kathua, Vijaypur, then come to some, uh, this place, uh, Almost outskirts of Jammu, right. that Ratuchak, Kaluchak, then you go to Sidra, hmm. then you go to Port Balwal, right. from Balwal you go to Akhnur. Right. This entire belt has grown at least 15 to 20 percent of Muslim domination. Right. Sidra has become and Batindi are two major pockets of Kashmiri Muslim. Right. Gujjas and Bakarwal separate. Right. Where are these people coming from? When you go towards Rajori, right. you see from Rajor, Akhnur to Rajori, you will see from helicopters, you see from air, you see thousands of Huts and houses have come up. Right. It is the slow demographic, settle, change, right. it's a demographic change and settlement of Muslim taking right. place around the Jammu division. Right. Another 10 years down the line, mm. when you have voting in Jammu and Kashmir, mm. the maximum vote will be Muslim, they can right. drive away. Right. You look at Assam now. Yeah. It's now come to Assam. Yeah. I was reading yesterday in a report Assam, Mizopur, Dimapur, all these places. Uh, and and the eastern uh, UP, right. eastern Bengal, right. they are infested with Muslims, right. and their politicians, MLAs are not Muslim. Right. The demography is changing. Right. Now the grand design. There is something called Mughalistan or Mughalstan. Right. 
Now, this damn paper has been released by Bangladesh. Hmm. There are two agencies, the PAC, ISI, hmm. Inter-Services Agency, Intelligence Agency, and the Pakistan DGFI, hmm. Director General of Forces Intelligence. Hmm. Now, all three forces, they have one central agency called DGFI. Right. It was created, this paper was written by Bangladeshi University. Hmm. They have now got a caliphate or a link between Bangladesh and Pakistan. Hmm. And how can they generate this link? They can generate by taking North India, hmm. coming inside towards UP belt right. and then coming along the Indo-Gangetic plains, right. along the Nepal border, you know, Lakhimpur and yes, all these areas yes. and coming down and joining, coming down south and joining Bangladesh. Right. From Siliguri corridor coming down to Bengal, East Bengal hmm. and into Bangladesh. Right. This is the kind of a arch that yeah. they have planned at all. Hmm. And this paper was released in 2008 and we Indian Indians are sleeping. Yes. We are sleeping and we are fighting for the government which has taken us such a grand step of NRC and CAA, right. Citizen right. Amendment Act. Right. They said Muslims will not be given citizenship, that is the Muslims who come from outside. Yeah. Indian Muslim, nothing would happen to them. Coming to that sir, because uh, from the past 15 minutes the way you've told, uh, you know, the rise because the change in demog demography and uh, rise of Muslim population at the belt, should the Indian Muslim, we all have friends right, Muslims, we've grown up with them right. Should people like them be scared? Like why are they, like, you know? And the common Muslim is not scared. Like I was telling they you, aren't, they the aren't. children didn't know what the hell is happening. Right. Their, their minds are being polluted. Right. Now what is happening is, if you look at Afghanistan and Pakistan, where right. the minority Sikhs, right. by Hindu, Christian, Parsi, they, were, they are gradually being driven out. Right. From 14-15% during partition or maybe slightly more, they have been two. reduced to point something hmm. percentage. Right. Barely 7,000 people total there. Okay. I believe the figure is going down and now they are again doing this kind right. of stuff there. Right. So they are driving them out. So hmm. they are reducing them by various methods. Hmm. Islamization, picking up Hindu and Sikh girls, converting them to Islam, yes. marrying them. Yes. So gradually they are removing the minorities from Afghanistan and Pakistan. Hmm. Same thing is happening in Bangladesh. Hmm. Now, and same thing has happened in POK. Yes. There are no Kashmiri Muslims, very few people remaining around the Neelam Valley. Right. And most of them have been married by Punjabi Muslims. Mm. Yes. So POK today is infested with Punjabi Muslims. Right. So in a talk I, I told in Kashmir that you the day Pakistani walks in, you bloody Kashmiri Muslims are going to face the front. Mm. Your beautiful women, Kashmiri women, are going to be taken by Pakistani Punjabi Muslims. Mm. Four, four of them will be married by one guy and they say, oh, there will be no Kashmiri Muslim. Mm. There will be no Kashmiriya or all that stuff left any longer. Right. So wake up. Mm. So our Muslims, I don't know which agency, it is the it is the leftist, the opposition which is scared of its future, that they are going to such a limit that it, they have thrown nationalism out of the bloody window. Mm. They are the people who are driving people mad. Mm. The Citizenship Amendment Act and the National Registration is very simple. Yes. You see, when you go to a foreign country, you apply for a visa. Yes. Can you fly into any country and then let you in? No. So you have to have a visa. Yes. That means you are an outsider coming in. Right. But most of the Muslims who have come from Bangladesh, Pakistan and various other places have infiltrated in, into yes. India through various devious means and they don't have proper visas or entry documents. Illegal. Now they gradually, the illegal, then yeah. imagine Rohingyas reach Jammu and Kashmir. Yes. The Bangladeshis are sitting in Buller Lake mm. in Srinagar. Mm. In Kashmir, hmm. where have they come from? Hmm. Who allowed them? Where is the registration? Hmm. Where are the visas? Hmm. So what is wrong in telling that, we, okay, let's do a, ch a check, an audit check right. of whoever is a citizen of India, hmm. by descent, by religion, by birth, by naturalization, you were born in families. Right. Or if you somehow you don't have proper documentation, apply for your citizenship right. and you will get it. Right. You know, you become a citizen by birth is fine yes. in a country. But your parents should have been citizen of that yes. country. Yes. Not illegal mm -hmm. immigrants. When you are born here, you become Indian citizen, but your parents were illegally entered. Yes. So to set that right, mm -hmm. the national registration certificate is being issued and, and the register is being maintained. Simple. And mm -hmm. Amendment Act, which the government has done, is right. a very sensible thing. All those people have talked about Afghanistan, right. Bangladesh, even Sri Lanka and Pakistan who have been driven out, mm. Hindus, Sikhs, Parsis, Christians from there, mm. who have who are again lost poor chaps are totally migrants and they have they have migrated out of this country. Right. Now Indian government has shown a large heartedness and welcomed their move here and granting them citizenship for once. Okay, we'll take a check and audit and grant citizenship mm. to all these people, they become Indian. Right. Whereas 
they said we will not grant citizenship to Muslims who have come from this country. Mm. There are two reasons. Right. One is when the Muslims come. Right. Why did they come to India? Hindu dominion. Mm. And they come and here say Hindustan mein aare. Hume mm. Pakistan apne Shariat lao chahi bhai tumhe Muslim country mein jao. Go to Saudi Arabia, go to whoever, wherever you want to go to Afghanistan, go to Pakistan, go beyond Uzbekistan, wherever you want to. They are saying that uh, Shias and Ahmadiyas are discriminated right. against. Yes. So, by the Indian government very right in saying, we are the Muslims who have illegal immigrants into the country are not welcome. Hmm. Go back to your country. Hmm. Don't the Jammu people want the Rohingyas to go back? Don't the Indian masses, Indian citizens want the Rohingyas to be driven out of India? Right. So why the hell are they fighting now? Hmm. They have not understood. They have been fooled. Now, why are they being fooled? For two reasons. Right. If Hindu Sikhs, Parsis, this, that becomes citizen by this amendment act, why? BJP government, right. the BJP vote bank gains their vote bank. Right. This is the thinking of the opposition. Right. It's not vote bank. Right. It is an act which should have been done by NDA and UPA government long time back, but it has never given a serious thought. Mm. This act, you are giving granting citizenship to your own people, mm. own people who are offshoots from India. Right. It doesn't say that they are going to give vote for the BJP next time. Right. That is the worry of. Congress and other opposition parties. Right. Okay, this will happen. Hmm. So they said they got that little lacuna. Uh. They said, oh, bloody Muslims, they are no Urk Muslims. Uh. Urk, and bloody fight against the government, do road protest and right. this and that, and what is happening in right. JNU. It's all nonsense. Hmm. Indian people should understand and sit at home. Hmm. You know, and don't let these leftists or the opposition parties air their stupid feelings hmm. and drive the students crazy. Right. It's, it's sad that the people of India are not understand. Right. Wow. <laughs> it was amazing, sir. Anything else that you would like to share, sir? Well, uh, what I like to say is uh, in the end that, you know, uh, two points. One, I'll talk about forces hmm. just for a minute. Yes. Since I'm now myself a veteran and ex army officer, the government should start giving due credence to the defense forces hmm. so that the sovereignty of the country is respected and maintained with a deterrent strength, a deterrent conventional strength, yes. Army, Navy, Air Force. Lo money should be allocated. Mm. The procedures of procurement that is going on by the Ministry of Defence and other people should be cut down. Like the Ministry of Home is done. Mm. Ministry of the Home does not follow the procurement procedures what the Ministry of Defence is doing. Okay. Ministry of Home wanted to pick up 40,000 pistols for BSF, they just went to the market, picked it up and bought it. Right. No middle they middle want middle. to, there is no procurement equipment, they are very short circuited procurement mm -hmm. method and that is how it should be. Right. Let the government do the procurement, why are you involving Army, Navy, Air Force? Right. Army, Navy and Air Force should come into play only when the equipment is bought right. from the shelf, right. commercially of the shelf, courts equipment. Five best, you want rifles for Indian Army, mm -hmm. take the best five rifles of the world bring them into India. Mm. This should be done by common. Right. And the trial should be given to India now. Right. Do a trial and out of this file tell which one is the best you want. Right. We say, okay, we want this. It's like a child, you know. Yeah. There are five chocolates, which one do you want? He says, I want this Cadbury. Uh -huh. So, okay, buy Cadbury. Right. So, there is no problem then. Mm. But the short circuiting is being done by the bureaucrats. Mm. They want to make money. Mm. They, are, they want to do government to government deal. And all those things, there's a lot of really ruckus and a lot of scams in it, right. which we have been reading about. Mm -hmm. Look at Augusta helicopter, yeah. look at Rafael, and Bofors. what have you, Bofors, yeah. you know, thanks to both the kind of governments. Right. Bofors was one of the best guns that the country has got. Yes. Do you know the transfer of technology of Bofors came to India when we bought Bofors? And when I was doing National Defense College, right. there was a person, Mr. Garg, right. Mukul Kumar Garg, who was heading this project in Kanpur. Right. You know, he said, I can make the gun. I said, are you sure? How is this? Yes, sir. Bofors. Right. I can make in India. Okay. I said, what do you mean I can? Do you have the TOT? He said, yes, I have the TOT right from there. TOT will be? Transfer of technology. Right. right. Why right. didn't you do that? Huh. He says, I was never given even intent for producing one gun by Indian Army. Hmm. Or in other words, from the MOD. Hmm. I said, why not? He said, because of the scam, the damn thing was lying in the, you know, cold, kind of in a fridge. Right. I said, what can you tell me? He says, if I get it, I do it. Hmm. And luck would have it, I was posted from NDC after right. finishing that course in the military operations department. Right. I was DDGMO. Right. And that came in my charter. Hmm. And I walked up to the DGMO and I told him, hmm. that, sir, the guns can be produced and here is it. I have spoken and rechecked with Mr. Mukul Kumar Gar, who is reposted back to Kanpur to head that project. Right. He can do it. Right. He said, are you sure? I said, yes. 
the file was moved hmm. and he produced two prototypes one bofors and one thing called soltam soltam, soltam gun is a little longer barrel okay like bofors right. which is an israeli copy and they were made and they have been dhanush is the name given to it they have been cleared by indian army and now they mean manufactured right so we are such a kind of a dope country it, yes and it was because of mr garg uh, yes shout out to mr garg yeah, yeah shabash and my kudos to him yeah. but he yeah. got to retire yes he is sitting back home right he was in etrc also and he was in kanpur he was, he was a great awesome. man awesome. and he produced it right we can produce right indians have no problem in mm-hmm. fact after retirement i worked in a production unit of right making components for tanks right and i can tell you a layman on the street was making them it is very much possible we mm-hmm. can make in india provided the procedures are open up mm-hmm. there is trust deficit in the civil community yes. in our private companies mm-hmm. a private company can produce anything from aircraft to ships to guns to weapons to explosive everything can be made Mm. So why did the damn bureaucracy let it happen? Mm. That is one. Yes, you know that's the unfortunate. So the, I wanted to say two point. One was allow the privatization of industry, right. simplify the procurement procedures mm. like military ministry of homes mm. and procure your technology as soon as possible. Right. Immediately buy from foreign. Right. Let make it India project carry on because yes. it will not graduate suddenly like Arjun tank. Right. It has been so many years. Mm. We wanted to produce the number one tank in the world overnight, which is not possible. Yep. It's impossible. Right. So let the thing carry on. Mm. The the grades and upgrades should come up, mm. but buy immediately from outside so that you retain your strength and you are grown up as a conventional strength. Mm. I mean, Navy, Air Force, and let the civil industry, DRDO, and all these people carry on gradually till they mature into a proper agency right. and they can produce such. Right. Second issue is. Indians. Hmm. Now, Indian Swachh Bharat, for example, Swachh Bharat is not being understood by the Indian hmm. because the large portion of our country is below poverty line and rural people. Hmm. Almost, if I may put a figure to it, around seventy-nine percent. Yes. Backward, yes. uneducated. Yes. A lot of effort is going in, hmm. but it will take some time. Yes. But who, who? Nobody is driving that. Hmm. Nobody is driving that. There have no. The state governments are not holding hand of the central. Mm-hmm. Here is a comment for change, Mr. Narendra Modi, our mm-hmm. honourable Prime Minister and Home Minister and what have you, Defence Minister. When they give out now these policies, they should be caught by the state governments yes, yes. and given a full gusto. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that is not happening. Yes, it should happen. State governments must support central government schemes and see how will we grow. Right. We are not going because of this. Right. That is the stumbling block. And yes. bureaucracy now should be put in its place by the government. Yes. By the government, by the politicians, mm. they should ask for the previous reports, put them on my table by tomorrow morning. Mm. Why are they taking six six months for a file to be lying in a bloody Ministry of Defence? Right. It doesn't move. Mm. It doesn't move. Yeah. Politicisation of the army or the army navy air force, putting people who are third in the seniority, fourth in seniority as number one in making yes. chiefs of army yes. navy air force, is bad for India. Mm. Is bad. It will bring in rivalry, unhealthy rivalry. It will fissures the repair. The fissures become big cracks, yes. and there will be division in the army, navy, air force, and we don't want that. No. If that happens, it's sad. On one one hand, you're making a CDS. Mm. On the other hand, you are following these kind of techniques. Thanks to the bureaucrats of Modi, who are giving wrong advice to the to the government. Mm. The government said nicely and thankfully has followed the principle of seniority this time in the army and made General Narawne. As the chief, chief, yes, they have not superseded the people who are yes. also in the rank with them. Right. Why should they be in rank at that level? Mr. Manoj, right? Uh, Manoj, General, 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 All these are excuses that he has got more exposure in CIA. Mm. Then what was that the MS branch doing? Mm. It is called a sector profile. The MS branch is sending the most of the army. I will I will not hesitate to say a maximum number of infantry officers are subjected to Jammu and Kashmir posting six to seven times. I can rattle them off at fingertips mm. by names. Six, six, seven, seven tenures mm. for what? Have they mastered insurgency? 
Have they been able to remove insurgency over the last 30 years in, in, in Jammu and Kashmir because of 7-7 posting? Mm. From a bloody company commander to a core commander to an army commander, in Jammu and Kashmir you boast I have gone 7 10 years and I am a master of Kashmir, I know Kashmir backhand. Mm. What did you do when you were commander? Why didn't the insurgency stop? Mm. Why hasn't the infiltration stopped? Right. Why couldn't you come out with new techniques? Mm. So these are the stupidities which are going on. Government should understand that. Mm. Sector profile is very important. Yeah. An officer who is to rank beyond brigadier, mm. beyond brigadier rank, he should be put to all four commands, east, north, south, east, west, and given exposure so they are competent enough right. to rise to that level. And from there, when he right. becomes an army commander, seniority principle should be maintained. Yes. Otherwise, why did you make him an army commander? Mm. If he was not fit enough and he didn't have this exposure or that exposure, why did you make him an army yes. exactly. It's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> He's commanding a bloody army. Yeah. And tomorrow there's a war. He'll get the entire army bloody butchered. Mm -hmm. he, because he didn't have exposure. Right. So these are excuses. Right. So I, I, thought, I leave it at that. Yeah. And I hope the corrections take place. It was, it was, it was amazing talking to you, sir. Thank you so much yeah, for doing this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, sir. So nice.